you would try to first check which properties do not depend on the set under question, but rather on the operations themselves. All right. If I do that, I would see that this commutativity presumably has nothing to do with what? The set I have chosen. It is about the operation, right? So, this commutativity I may not need to check. Same with the associativity here, same with the associativity here and the distributivity here, right? What else can I say? So, this closure, this identity and this inverse have to be checked for this addition, right? Here this closure has to be checked, okay? Of course, this has to be also checked, right? Sorry? Yeah, so if you, if you are convinced that it is closure, so depends on how we are proposing to check. What is the test criteria we are putting together? So, if you are putting together a clever test criteria, then we might actually do away with two checks. With one check, we can do this. So, we are trying to design that test, test for when it is a subspace. Given that you are inheriting from a parent space, when it is a subspace, that is what we are trying to check. So, we want an efficient uh, test for that. So, you, you have to figure out that this one in the field acting on this must also give you back this. Oh, so this should be, sorry, W, right? Yeah. So, this should be W. So, now we have to propose such a scheme. But before that, let us also turn our attention to the following. I am going to claim something like this. Again, this requires sort of a proof. Okay, what is the proof? See, the statement of this is profound. On the right hand side, what do we have? In the language of vector spaces and all, what is this? This is the additive inverse of a vector v, okay, for all v in v. This is the additive inverse of a vector, is it not? And on the left hand side, I am giving you a recipe for obtaining the additive inverse. What am I saying? I am saying, go ahead, look for the multiplicative identity in the field, take its additive inverse. So, the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity of the field acting on this vector by means of the scalar multiplication that I have defined leads to the additive inverse of the element itself. Yeah? Again, those ones and zeros should not be read as something trivial. Can we prove this? How, how do we prove this then? So, how, what, do, what is our starting point? 0 dot v is equal to? One. Sorry? 1 plus minus 1 dot v. Right. So, 1 plus minus 1 dot v. Right. And then, because this I know what, I have already seen this, right? What this object is going to be? Right. So, this is nothing but the 0 of the vector space, no? Right. That is that's what we have just proved a while back. And what is this? Distributivity 1 times v plus minus 1 acting on v. Now, this is of course just v plus minus 1 acting on v. Let me add equals to both sides so that they still remain equal. So, I will just going to, I am just going to add minus v which is the additive inverse of v to both sides and I am going to have minus v plus v. I am going to combine them through associativity. So, that I have this, this of course reduces to the identity, the additive identity in the vector space which is 0 of v plus minus 1 on v which means that the additive identity is nothing but the additive inverse, sorry the additive inverse is nothing but the additive inverse on the field of the multiplicative identity 
acting on the vector yeah so you know these tidbits here and there we need to convince ourselves that these are true and now with this being said we are in a position to propose a condition that has to be checked in order for something to be a subspace and here's the proposition just a one line check what is the consequence if this is true we'll try and convince you that this is indeed true but let's first see what is the consequence of this if this is true the consequence is you pick out two arbitrary elements without loss of generality from the set w and pass it through the, just this one check the closure take any one of the objects take the other object scaled by alpha so this is a scalar multiplication that's carried out with w1 and see that if this passes the test so you don't assign some special properties to your w1 and w2 just choose any arbitrary w1 and w2 any arbitrary alpha and if you can show that despite that arbitrariness this object let's call it w hat still resides inside w and you don't need anything outside of w let's say inherited from the parent space v then that w is rightfully a subspace in itself in other words it's going to be also a vector space in its own right that is this object is also a vector space okay so how do i try and convince you of this i'm just going to check out against these meaningful properties because you see the ones i have ticked out do not need to be checked as i said because they are inherent in the operations themselves okay so how do we check for the closure so if i choose alpha is equal to 1 if i choose alpha is equal to 1 then isn't the closure under vector addition given because what i am doing is just picking out w1 w2 arbitrarily and adding them and i'm claiming that each of them must belong to w so that means by choosing alpha is equal to 1 i am assuring myself that this operation of addition must be closed and this must be swept over all possible alphas so i've just chosen one alpha one legitimate alpha which is just one so that means if i have verified that this is true for all alpha all w1 all w2 then alpha is equal to 1 is just one such alpha so that has also been covered that base has been covered in my check so that means this test is holistic in the sense that it is already checked for the closure if something has passed this test it has already passed this closure test that's all i need to convince myself that once something passes that test it passes all the remaining tests remaining meaningful tests i mean these i don't care about because they come about just as a consequence of the operation themselves right okay what about the identity what about the identity in view of what we have just proved choose any w call it w2 call that same w as w1 and choose alpha to be minus 1 so for this you choose w1 is equal to w2 is equal to some w right 
and alpha is equal to minus 1. In view of what I have just proved a while back, when you take minus 1 times this w, it is nothing but the additive inverse. So, if the additive inverse gets added with the number itself, it must result in the 0, the additive identity and therefore, if you have swept over all possible alphas, all possible w's, w1 and w2, you have already covered the case when 0 must be a part of the set w because otherwise it would not have been closed, right. So, therefore, this check also verifies this. What about the inverse? Once you know that the additive identity is part of the set, choose w1 is equal to some w, w2 is equal to the 0. I know that the 0 belongs now because of this second point that is already been checked. So, therefore, w2 is equal to 0 must also be a part of it and choose alpha is equal to minus 1. So, therefore, for every object w that you might pick from the set w, big w, any little w that you pick from big w, 0 of course also comes from big w because of our previous point here and with alpha is equal to minus 1, you have the point that minus of w that is the additive inverse must also be a part of this w. You have checked for the existence of the additive inverse in w itself. In other words, the addition property is all check out, yeah. What do we need to check now? The closure. How do we do that? Well, is it really difficult? Because we are already scanning over all possible alphas. So, choose w1 is any w, yeah, w2 as 0 and alpha sweep over all possible alpha in f. That is what you are anyway required to do under this check because you are going to check for all possible alpha. That is already specified as part of your prescription. So, you are anyway going to do it as part of this check. So, that means if you have performed this check, this also happens to reduce to a special case of that check. So, this closure property is there. What about this? Well, the 1 has to be part of the field, right? And again, the closure, as your friend said a while back, your friend said that this property is a consequence of the closure. So, nothing to be checked here, right? Because it is inherited already. 1 is, see, the field is already inherited here. So, that 1 must be there because of the multiplicative identity in the field that must exist in a field. Therefore, this 1 must be there. And the original parent spaces operations are still legitimate here. So, this is also true, right? So, therefore, in other words, at least even if, even if I have not written a complete formal proof of this, you can now convince yourself that given that I pick out a big W which is a subset of this big V and inherits these same operations under the same field, if I ask you the question as to whether the newly constructed structure also has the properties of a vector space, in other words, if it is a subspace of the original vector space, it just suffices that you check this against arbitrary objects, a couple of arbitrary objects in W and an arbitrary scalar, yeah. So, maybe I will take a couple of examples now and show you how it is done so that you get a feel for how this, how this check works and how elegant it is, okay. So, I am going to first claim that certain objects are subspaces. So, the moment I say something is a subspace, there must be something that is an original a bigger vector space that is sitting over there whose subspace I am claiming this new object to be, okay. So, let us say because we understand matrices better, let us just take the examples of some matrices. If there are any questions, please ask. Yeah, yeah. So no, it is not circular. In order to prove this, I did not require this. I mean, sorry, in order to prove this, I required this. In order to prove this, I did not require this. Oh, you mean? But that is independent of that, I had already proved you. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, no, sure. I mean, probably his confusion came from there. So, I thought maybe you were taking the same. 
not be a part of capital W base. Sorry? When you are when proving identity. Yeah. No, 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 but, but you see you are asking for this to be part for all possible alphas. So, for alpha is equal to minus 1 this has to be a part. That is what the check is. But at that point, at that point you are saying that whether this check covers this base. Now, this check allows me to put alpha is equal to minus 1, nothing prevents me. I may not know that whether individually it belongs or not. Yeah, exactly. So, minus 1 times alpha. But the overall object definitely belongs. Yeah, overall object should belong, but the individual object I don't yet know. I don't yet know. Later on, it will it will come to later on it will come to effect that because of the closure, but actually because of the closure property, you can say that if you take two objects and you take their sum, then they must belong there, right? So if you take two objects and their sum, and on the right hand side you have another object, and you take its inverse on both sides, so any sum, the constituent components cannot help but belong to that vector space. Otherwise, it wouldn't be closed, because even when you are subtracting so called subtraction, you are basically doing this additive inverse and adding it, right. So, you are adding objects in any case. So, that closure will guarantee that it has to exist. So, it is all connected. In this step, you are using this step, but in this step, you are not using any property other than the fact that, which is why I proved it just before this, that you have to sh know that minus 1 acting on, that is the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity acting on any vector results in the additive inverse of the vector. But that is independent of any of these properties. That is something that came from the parent spaces property itself. So, that is the only thing I have used in proving this. I have not used this in proving this. I have just used this in proving this. So, it is not circular, right. So, I will just take the example of uh, matrices. And I will cook up two such objects specifically. So, consider A belonging to general field by the way, not real or complex, okay. M cross N matrices over any general field, okay. Now, the first thing you have to understand is F M is a vector space over F and F n is a vector space over F. Do you agree with these? Again, I am not going to prove this. Just take this as an exercise to convince yourself that when you have n tuples or a finite number of tuples of objects from a certain field. Yeah, and you stack them up as a column of numbers. In fact, you can stack them up as rows of numbers also. It matters not. So long as you know how that vector addition in Euclidean spaces works. Here, of course, when I say over the field, that means it respects the fields addition and multiplication operations. So if it is the module, if it is a finite field, for example, you will have the modulo operations. So when you take an object from the field, multiply it with an object that is an n-tuple of the objects from that field and you are multiplying them, in the usual scalar manner, every number gets multiplied or scaled, you have to take the modular multiplication. So, it somehow embeds that operation of the field to that n tuple, okay. So, I am not explaining all of that in detail of course, but I hope that I expect you to understand that in that common sense. Hmm? If I want to be very precise, I must also mention that, but you know I have not defined that plus and dot, assuming that you understand what that plus and dot is, okay. Now, these are vector spaces. I am going to define the following objects. One, I am going to call this as image of A is equal to the following set, which is X belongs to, of course, it is N. Okay. I am going to define a second object which is 
this is called the kernel of A. So where is this y coming from by the way? What do you think this is a subspace of? If at all it is a subspace. F, F M, right? Okay. So this apparently comes from F M. So this comes from, well of course, it is there in the definition itself. So you might as well guess this is M, this is F M. Now if I want to prove that these two are subspaces, given that I believe, I have left it as an exercise for you to prove, but given that I believe that these are indeed vector spaces, what I am required to show is that this image is a subspace of F m, F to the m, m tuples of members in the field and kernel is a subspace of n tuples in the field, right. How do we show this based on what we have just proposed over there and hopefully given you a, an idea about why this proposition works. Okay. So what I have to do is I have to pluck out two arbitrary objects. I have to pluck out two arbitrary objects in this, right. So for one pick y1 is equal to a x1 for some x1 in f to the n and y2 is equal to a x2 for some x2 in f n. If I am saying that y1 and y2 must be in the image of A, then they must be representable in the form Ax1 and Ax2. There must be some x1 and x2 such that y1 and y2 are representable in this manner. Now consider y1 plus alpha y2, right? What is this equal to? This is nothing but a x1 plus alpha a x2 and because of the usual properties of matrix multiplications, we can say that this is nothing but x1 plus alpha x2. But what is this? x1 plus alpha x2, can I not write this as a x hat where x hat belongs to? an n tuple of members in the field. But that by definition implies that y1 plus alpha y2 is representable in the same form that would imply that it is a part of the image of A. This means y1 plus alpha y2 must belong to image of A and I am done. I picked out arbitrary y1 and y2 members from the image of the set A, uh, sorry, the set that is the image of A, right? And then I showed you that y1 plus alpha y2 cannot help but also belong to the image of A, which means that the image must be a subspace. We know it is already something that is sitting inside this m tuple. An m tuple, this m tuple is already a vector space. So all that I needed to check was this by that proposition. So that is the power of that proposition. Any time you are asked to check whether something or show that something is a, vector, a subspace and you know it is sitting inside some bigger vector space, you only have to know how to massage it into this form. The same thing we can make it work for uh, the kernel. Let us quickly do that in a minute or so. And you will have more exercises by tonight on these sort of topics. So the next thing is say x1 comma x2 belong to <coughs> kernel of A implies 
a x 1 is equal to 0 and a x 2 is equal to 0, right. This is even simpler. Consider x 1 plus alpha x 2 where alpha is arbitrary. Then it implies that a acting on x 1 plus alpha x 2 is equal to because of the distributivity of mul matrix multiplication with a vector. This is a x 1 plus alpha a x 2. Of course, individually there are zeros. So, this is also 0 which means that x 1 plus alpha x 2 must also belong to the kernel of A. And the kernel of A that set is sitting inside an n tuple that is f n. Therefore, it must be a subspace of f n. So, the image of A is a subspace of f m. The kernel of A is a subspace of f n, okay. These are only two special examples of uh, subspaces. In the next lecture, we shall look at more general examples such as things called span, okay, span of a set of vectors and we will see that even that turns out to be a subspace and we will hopefully deal with a lot more other abstract objects. Thank you.